a few words before we start. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Well, before we read today's scripture, which is a doozy, um, I just want to start by setting the scene and, and just say a few words about the psychology of disgust and contamination. So caveat for the whole sermon is I'm drawing heavily on a book called Unclean by Richard Beck. Uh, Richard's one of my favorite theological writers. He's also a psychologist, so he brings a lot of psychology into what he writes. And um, I recommend this book highly, Unclean by Richard Beck. I would lend it to anyone here who's local and wants to borrow it. Um, but he talks about um, just this whole idea of the psychology of disgust. And I find it really interesting that there's this evolutionary thing built in where, you know, the homo sapiens species in order to survive has had to develop a, a sort of revulsion to certain contaminants and germs. You know, in our, our breakout room, Stephanie said she's a 15 when it comes to germs in terms of sanitizing things. And we've had to learn to react these ways to certain um, smells and sights and tastes to just um, expel them out of our, our mouths and vomit them out or spit them out in order to survive, to create this boundary to keep us safe. But um, we've developed a psychology around disgust and contamination that's sometimes not super logical, it's, that goes beyond logic. So he tells the story of Paul Rosen, who's a, a researcher. Um, he researches disgust and I want to I want to look at everybody here because I want to do a little I want to do the experiments on you. So he basically has an experiment where he uh, shows people a glass of juice with a cockroach in it. Okay, glass of juice with a cockroach. He takes the cockroach out and asks who would drink this juice. So show of hands those here who would drink the cockroach juice. Anybody? Okay. Mark is the only, <laughs> come on, Mark, you're messing with my thing. <laughs> then he takes the juice, he boils it in front of them, cools it down, puts it back in the glass. Who would drink the boiled cockroach juice? Anybody? Boiled? Oh, a few hands for that one. And then he passes it through a filter, like the filter that you put to purify tap water. It's supposed to remove everything. Anybody drink it after the boiling and the filtering? Probably a few more hands on that one too. Okay. So when he did these tests, amazingly, like a lot of people still refuse to drink the juice after all of these methods of trying to purify it. He also did a test I, I thought was hilarious with a sterilized, never before used bedpan, like out of the package and lemonade inside it and asked people to drink it again with interesting results. Anyway, this guy, Paul Rosen, came up with this four part psychology of disgust and contamination. And I'm gonna ask Tuesday to just throw that up on a slide. So a four part um, psychology of contamination. First, that it's a contact based thing. So basically um, touch, physical proximity confers contamination. So we need quarantine, we need separation. Um, second, that it is dose insensitive. So no matter how much or how little of this contaminant is present, it's gonna be harmful. Third, that it's permanent. So that's the thing with the cockroach, that once something's contaminated, it's hard psychologically to see it as rehabilitated. And finally, negativity dominant. So when a so-called contaminant and a so-called pure object come in contact, the contaminant is stronger and ends up ruining the purity of that object. So that, that's the psychology. I'm gonna bring that slide up again, but that's good for now, Tuesday. So when it comes to food that's contaminated or even maybe COVID rules, we've talked a lot about COVID today, these, these sort of logical things might be considered going a little bit overboard, but really being on the safe side, you know, like taking extra precautions. I do find it ironic how, how many of us have had COVID recently. I've had a cold this week and preaching about contamination and purity in that context is just interesting. Um, but the real issue comes when we recruit this powerful evolutionary psychology of contamination and disgust and project it onto human beings whom we consider perhaps immoral, especially when we use scripture and theology to justify this, when it transforms from a psychology to a theology of contamination and is justified with words like purity and holiness. So with that in mind, I'm going to invite Wendy to read our scripture for us. And apologies to Wendy, there are some, some Hebrew names in here that might be tricky, but you've got this. <laughs> Thank you for agreeing last minute to read for us. Yeah, there we go. Okay, that, oh, there we are. <clears throat> 
While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you. So take courage and do it. So Ezra rose up and put the leading priests and Levites and all Israel under oath to do what had been suggested. And they took the oath. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the room of Jehoanan, son of Eli Eliashib. While he was there, he ate no food and drank no water because he continued to mourn over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. A proclamation was then issued throughout Judah and Jerusalem for all the exiles to assemble in Jerusalem. Anyone who failed to appear within three days would forfeit all his property in accordance with the decision of the officials and elders and would himself be expelled from the assembly of the exiles within the three days. All the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem, and on the twentieth day of the ninth month, all the people were sitting in the square before the house of God, greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> then the priest, then Ezra the priest, stood up and said to them, they obviously are not from Vancouver. Anyway, sorry. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women and adding to Israel's guilt. Now honor the Lord, the God of your ancestors and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. The whole assembly responded with a loud voice. You are right. We must do as you say. But there are many people here and it is the rainy season. So we cannot stand outside besides. This matter cannot be taken care of in a day or two because we have sinned greatly in this thing. Let our officials act for the whole assembly. Then let everyone in our towns who has married a foreign woman come at a set time, along with the elders and judges of each town, until the fierce anger of our God in this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, son of Asahel, and Jehaziah, son of Tikva, supported by Meshulam and Shabbatiah, the Levite, opposed this. So the exiles did, as was proposed. Ezra the priest selected men who were family heads and one from each family division, and all of them designated by name. On this first day of the 10th month, they sat down to investigate the cases. And by the first day of the first month, they had finished dealing with all the men who had married foreign women. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder if the uh, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, sticks in anyone's throat a little bit today after that scripture. I think that's actually okay. That's maybe a good sign. And we'll get to that later. But thanks, Wendy, for reading that. Um, what is going on here besides a bunch of people complaining about the rain? <laughs> it was fun watching you react to that in real time, Wendy. <laughs> so we've got a group who have returned from exile. We've been doing this whole series on the return from exile. And these people believe that the exile was a punishment from God because their ancestors sinned by allowing impurity, unholiness, contamination to take root in their community. So they're returning, they're committed to getting things right this time. And to them, this involves exerting control over who's in and who's out. Often we tighten up in these times. Who gets access to the temple, to land, to resources? Who doesn't? And some of this is a struggle between the Jews who were taken to exile and the Jews who were left behind during the exile, the poorer people who weren't seen as valuable enough to be taken to Babylon and who intermarried with God-fearing foreign people back during the Assyrian exile even. You may know them by their later name of Samaritans. The returning Jews see these people as mixed and therefore compromised, unholy, 
And the women in particular are contaminants that need to be expelled. There is a similar passage in Nehemiah 13, actually. Some people think it refers to the same incident. Some people think it's a whole different thing that's similar. Uh, in some ways, it's not as bad because it only deals with the priestly line, with the, the priests being married to foreign women and having their families separated, not the lay people. But in other ways, it's worse. There's actually a verse where Nehemiah says he beat some of the men and pulled out their hair when he found out that they'd married non-Jewish wives. So very zealous for his version of what God wanted. Now, some try to justify all of this by saying that this is about getting rid of women who were leading their husbands into idolatry, into adultery, into apostasy. In Nehemiah's version of the story, he reminds them that Solomon's foreign wives led him to sin. And yet that's not what it said in the text from Ezra that Wendy just read. There's no distinction between foreign wives who lead their husbands astray and those who follow the Jewish law. The issue is not their behavior, but their foreignness, their their sort of otherness that contaminated even their mixed race children. Um, Tuesday, could you throw that slide back up again? I just want to go through that list quickly when we think about this particular story. Contact base. These women had to be expelled to leave the community, to protect the community. There could be no further contact. Dose and senses of every foreign woman needed to leave. The whole community needed to come around this in order to please God. Permanence, even the children who were mixed race could not be rehabilitated. It was this thing that couldn't be taken away from them. And negativity, dominance, even the children's foreign blood in the eyes of these priests overpowered their any Jewishness that they had from their fathers. So thanks, Tuesday. This, this is a crisis about purity. This is a crisis about ethnic and religious cleansing. And it targets the most marginalized women and children among them. This is what they believed God and God's law demanded of them. But is this what God and God's law demanded? Now, I'm not a criminal defense lawyer <laughs> and the, the law in scripture, you know, Deuteronomy 7 does instruct Israel not to intermarry with the women of Canaan. For some preachers, especially certain evangelical ones whose sermons I've read this week, <laughs> this passage alone is enough to absolve Ezra and Nehemiah's actions instigated by Shechaniah even prompting some to paint this expulsion of women and children as a godly revival, as an example to be followed, a good leadership. But as most of you know, scripture is more complicated than this in all kinds of directions, even within the law itself. So if you read past Deuteronomy 7 into chapter 21, there's provisions for Israelites to force foreign women to marry them as part of the spoils of war. So again, not pretty picture, but a different thing. And if it says if a foreign wife tries to lead you into idolatry, she's to be put to death, not divorced. Again, an awful track record for the law when it comes to women in that case, but worth noting that it's confusing on this topic of intermarriage and there's no instruction to banish any children of these marriages. You know, I was remembering my Old Testament class at Regent College. This is a long time ago now, <laughs> but I remember my prof and I looked up my notes actually just to double check, but I remember my prof talking about Ezra and Nehemiah and saying, not every protagonist in scripture is an example to follow, even when they think that they're obeying God and following what God is saying to them. And that really uh, startled me. It gave me a sense of, you know, maybe I'm free, maybe I have permission to stop ignoring my, my gut, my instincts when I read scripture, my sense of right and wrong. And it freed me to be able to really believe that Ezra and Nehemiah were essentially proof texting one passage of Deuteronomy to justify a truly awful course of action in this scripture. One I think is that was based on the psychology of disgust and of scapegoating while ignoring so many other Hebrew scriptures and stories that say something very different about people from other countries, including ignoring the lives of their own beloved patriarchs. I mean, surely they knew the story of Abraham and Hagar, Hagar, which whose name means the foreigner, <laughs> the enslaved woman that, that Abraham cast out two times, once when pregnant with his child and again after Ishmael's birth but whom God met in the wilderness, who, who named God the God who sees me, and God protected her and her son Ishmael. And in Muslim tradition, she ends up 
founding the city of Mecca. I, I believe Ezra and Nehemiah should have known that God is with the ones that we cast out, the foreign women and children we cast out. And then, of course, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, marries Rachel, who's a worshiper of idols, who tries to hide her idols as she's leaving once. Rachel's son, Joseph, a hero of Israel, marries an Egyptian woman. And the, the liberator of the people of Israel, Mo Moses, marries a Cushite, Cushite woman. Rahab, the Canaanite, the Canaanites were the ones they were absolutely not supposed to marry with, gets accepted and married into the house of Israel for her good deeds. And Ruth, a Moabite, married Boaz, a Jew, and both Ruth and Rahab were ancestors of the beloved King David, and later, of course, of Jesus. Even books of scripture written around the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah took a very different tack when it came to intermarriage. So during the exile, the prophet Ezekiel wrote that when foreigners bear children in Israel, they are to be considered the same as native born Israelites. They are to receive inheritance as members of God's people. The book of Chronicles, which overlaps in telling this history at the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah is much more inclusive and tends to show mixed marriages as one way that Judah expands and develops within the land. And of course, we get the book of Jonah, which was probably written shortly after this, and it shows this prophet being called against his will to evangelize the Assyrians, whom God seems to care even more than Jonah cares about. You know, my, my view of scripture has changed over time, and I wonder if I'll hear this sermon in 10 years and be like, oh boy, it's shifted again. <laughs> but this is where I'm at right now, and here I'm happy to have a conversation with you if you're in a different place. I see the Hebrew scriptures and the Bible as a whole as not one unified book, but rather a whole library of books, a conversation between different authors and different editors. Some are more universalist, some are more nationalist, some emphasize purity and sacrifice, some emphasize hospitality and mercy. Scripture does not speak with one voice as much as I sometimes wish it would. Uh, the word is like Jesus, it's divine and human, it's incarnate, it's living, and it's a record of the relationship between God and humans over millennia. And because humans are involved, it's going to be messy, you know, and the spirit chose not to clean up that mess for us. Some people try to respond to that messiness by minimizing the internal conflicts within scripture and kind of baptizing everything in it, trying to explain away the genocide and the colonialism and the slavery and all kinds of harm that exist within the narrative of scripture as being somehow part of God's will for that time. But this move, I think, requires switching off our hearts and silencing our inner sense of what's good and what's harmful, which only ends up limiting the ways that the spirit can speak deep within us as we read. And, and it puts us at risk of perpetuating further harm. You know, I was reading about how these texts that we just read in Ezra and in Nehemiah were later used by preachers in the South in the United States to defend racial segregation. And I've also heard that passage referenced by people who believe that queer folks should be celibate, should not be married, and to, to tell people that, you know, God might approve of you dissolving your queer marriage and breaking up your queer family. So even though it's a messier process and obviously we have biases and we might get things wrong and our understanding is limited, I think our better course of action is to claim our responsibility to do, as, as Peter Fitch put it, to learn to interpret scripture toward love, to learn to interpret toward love. And that means reading carefully in community with the Spirit's help to try to sort out which part of scripture reflects God's enduring heart for God's people and which parts are maybe more reflective of our own messy, imperfect, trying to figure things out humanity. <clears throat> for example, I wouldn't call the Bible an anti-racist book as a whole because some of it was written and edited by people who had not reckoned with their racism. But I do believe that God is an anti-racist God and delights when we seek to interpret scripture in anti-racist ways and emphasize parts that lead us to anti-racist practices. I think there's some very misogynistic passages in scripture like the one we read today, but I believe God loves all women, cis women, trans women, wants us all to flourish and wants us to interpret scripture and add to the ongoing dialogue with the spirit in a way that leads to more flourishing. As people who follow Christ, who believe that 
that Jesus more than anyone shows us what God looks like. One way we can interpret scripture toward love is by reading through the filter, through the lens of Jesus' life. And I want to say that Jesus vehemently resisted contamination psychology. He refused to keep himself separate and quarantined from any so-called impure people. Uh, he let this, the woman anoint him. He healed people with leprosy by touching them, he, especially through his practice of, of the table, of eating meals with the wrong kinds of people. He told provocative stories about good Samaritans. <laughs> Ironically, that parable is one of the lectionary passages the, that probably millions of pre preachers are preaching about today. He had a conversation at a well with a Samaritan woman, like the, you know, the exact type of woman that is trying to get kicked out or that Ezra and Nehemiah are trying to kick out in these passages. And instead of you know, kicking her out, he makes her his first evangelist. But most importantly, I think Jesus challenged this notion of negativity dominance that was on that list, that the contaminant is stronger than the pure thing. In Matthew 9, when the Pharisees criticized Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners, they thought the tax collectors were making Jesus impure, rather than considering that the flow could travel in the opposite direction, that Jesus could render the tax collectors pure, that the powerful presence of his love could give them the dignity to heal and to make things right. In that passage in Matthew 9, Jesus quotes from the book of Hosea from the Hebrew scriptures, and he says to the Pharisees, you need to learn the meaning of this verse. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. He's using these words mercy and sacrifice to sum up what I see as kind of a central tension in scripture the impulse to mercy, to embrace, uh, versus the impulse to sacrifice, to maintain purity. More broadly, you could call it the prophetic tradition versus the priestly tradition, perhaps. And Jesus is quoting from a prophet and choosing, in this case, the prophet over the priest. It's mercy, not sacrifice. They're different psychological impulses. You can't really have both. You can't embrace people when you're capitulating to your disgust for them and god wants the embrace the ethic of mercy not sacrifice which is based on this harmful scapegoat mechanism of killing or expelling something to try to keep the community pure and holy i think jesus was working hard to decontaminate his people's theology and i hope you know that sermon title is very tongue-in-cheek because what jesus wanted was to remove the very idea of contamination, or at least the overemphasis and misapplication of that idea. He was teaching them that human beings are never contaminants. And as much as it satisfies our disgust driven evolutionary psychology to expel people, this will never render any of us pure. It is in fact a failure of mercy. It is injustice and injustice is what actually makes us unclean what comes out of us rather than what goes into us as he said once and again this is not about jesus inventing some new way of being as if the new testament is about mercy and the old testament is about sacrifice i mean for one thing the impulse to purity and sacrifice crops up in the new testament even after jesus's time i'm thinking about the story in first corinthians where paul is instructing the community to excommunicate someone this is not just an Old Testament or a Pharisee impulse. This, this challenged the early church and, and challenges us too. And then as we, we've already said, this ethic of mercy is found not just in Jesus's teaching, but throughout the Hebrew scriptures, especially in the prophets. My favorite example is another passage written either during or after the exile, depending on, on what you think, but Isaiah 56, one of my favorite scriptures, where God addresses the eunuch and the foreigner, the sexual and gender minority and the racial and ethnic minority. These two groups so often scapegoated and treated as impure as people to be excluded. And God says this, uh, let me read it from the screen. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. 
I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. This is my favorite part. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Thanks, Tuesday. Isn't that beautiful? As I'm learning to interpret toward love, I see this is the heart of who God is, this impulse to embrace, to gather, to enfold still more from beyond the community of exiles to join the beloved community. It's not about tightening the circle through expulsion. It's about widening the circle with mercy and hospitality. You know, there's one part of that passage from Ezra that Wendy read that gave me some hope. I mean, there's the part that where it's raining. I'm like, is that not a sign from God that what you're doing? Never mind. But uh, did you notice the verse that said, only Jonathan, son of Asahel, and Josiah, son of Tikva, supported by Meshulam and Sabbatai the Levite, opposed this. There was resistance, and those resistors were recorded. Maybe they were recorded to be shamed. I don't know. But there were people that resisted. I hope they snuck some provisions to the expelled women and children. I hope they continued their resistance to a theology of purity and disgust. Now, I think I'm preaching to the choir today. We are at Open Way because we are for inclusion. Kevin already said it, you know, we want a fully affirming, anti-racist, anti-misogynist faith and church. We strive to be those Jonathans, those Josiahs, those resistors. Many of us have actually been on the wrong end of purity laws. We have, some of us have been expelled, excommunicated, kicked out. Most of us here, I think, know what it feels like to be the victim of someone's discussed psychology and theology. Maybe you felt the effects of that kind of thing even this past week or this past month or this past year. So if I have any closing word for us, it's this. Let's not forget about those experiences. Let's remember how it felt to be expelled like that, to be treated in that way, not so that it embitters us or hardens us, but so that it can motivate us to work toward ending that harm for others. And maybe avoid causing that kind of purity driven harm ourselves, especially in times of stress, times of exile, times of apocalypse, when our fear drives us to do what we would not otherwise do. Because when I read Ezra and Nehemiah, I see a people exiled by Babylon who turn around and exile others and a people shamed by Babylon who perpetuate shame on others. You know, people who were living in fear, who try to reclaim control by forcing people with less power than themselves to live in fear. We are always at risk of transmitting our pain instead of transforming it, especially when we're pushed to our limits. So that's why we have this community. Let's hold each other accountable. Let's not let that powerful evolutionary disgust psychology be misused and directed toward people, even in situations where the world is falling apart and we feel like we have to tighten up. Let's keep practicing our shared practices of reconciliation, of unlikely friendship, of table fellowship around communion together. Let's find ways to draw healthy boundaries, to prioritize the dignity and safety of our most at-risk members, just as Jesus did when he was at the Pharisees' tables without developing a dehumanizing disgust reflex for those people who might be oppressing them or mentally limiting their capacity for transformation and inclusion through Jesus's powerful redemptive work. And as we read and interpret scripture together, let's commit to interpreting toward love. Let's claim boldly that no one is worthless or expendable in God's eyes. Let's claim the God of Hagar who met us in our wilderness and saw us. Let's worship the God of Rahab and Ruth, the foreign grandmothers of Jesus, the God whose house of prayer is a house for all nations, the God whose heart is not to exclude, but to gather still more of these messy humans to join in on this beloved community, the God who desires mercy and not sacrifice.
Thanks for listening. Amen.